Hello, everybody. This is Eric Enga. I'm the CEO of Stone Temple Consulting. This is the Digital Marketing Excellence Show. And today, we are going to be talking about how does Google determine content quality? And we want to make sure that we hear, hear from you uh, how you think it's determined. So please put your thoughts in the comments. Load it up. Let's get lots of thoughts in there. We'll probably pick them out uh, all in good turn. Uh, as always, delighted to have uh, Mark Traphagen as my co-host. Say hi, Mark. Hi, Mark. Hi, Mark. Okay. Oh, there you go. And everybody in the audience can say hi, Mark, too. Uh, and this whole show actually kind of started out of a, a conversation around uh, uh, Bill Slosky's uh, recent post on the Moz blog called Unraveling uh, Panda Patents. So uh, given that we're talking about his post, we thought we'd have Bill join us. Say hi, Bill. Hi, Bill. <laughs> uh, very, well done, Bill. Uh, and then uh, uh, David Harry uh, here uh, has uh, uh, evidently spent, spent about uh, four lifetimes reading through the uh, the, the uh, search uh, uh, ratings guide that came out from Google uh, recently, uh, search quality ratings guide, and uh, uh, and he's going to talk. So say hi, David. Hello, Bill. <laughs> and then Eamon Johns has this really cool TV set behind him uh, showing dancing pandas, and uh, that's why we invited him. Say hi, Eamon. Hi, Eamon. Hi, Eamon. Uh, no, maybe there was some other reason why we invited you too, but uh, um, uh, no, tons of reasons. Uh, actually, I'm really excited because these guys are some of the long... Uh, uh, well, gray hair, no hair, too much hair, depending on which one you're talking about. Um, and uh, uh, but more importantly, have been doing uh, SEO for uh, uh, well since the age of the dinosaurs, basically. Um, and uh, they just know so much about it. Um, and we're going to have a fantastic discussion about how uh, you know how Google thinks about search quality. We're going to start from a panda perspective because that's where Bill started, and it really brings out a whole bunch of really cool stuff. Uh, and I said how Google determines search quality, and how Google determines content quality. Let's get more focused, get the term right, because mm -hmm. uh, that's really a very unique thing. You know, we're not we're not in Link La La Land here now. We're we're looking at content. So, um, so uh, Bill, why don't you uh, start us off by uh, talking a little bit about uh, uh, what you wrote about, and then we'll let the conversation go from there. Okay, I'm going to shoot back really quickly uh, to about two and a half months ago or so when I was searching through the patents at the USPTO and came across a patent with the name Navneet Panda attached to it as one of the inventors. I wrote a blog post over at SEO by the Sea on it. I looked at Navneet's Google Plus profile, and in his bragging rights section, he... Uh, wrote that he was the father of the Panda update. So I made a screen print, which was good. I posted that along with my post on SEO by the Sea. Uh, and, and somebody sent me a, a tweet almost immediately afterwards saying that uh, Navneet had removed his bragging rights section. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess he didn't like being identified by that. Okay, jump forward to about two, three weeks ago, I, I guess two, and I'm, I'm searching through the patent office and I see uh, uh, one where in a, in a section, so granted patents have a section where they uh, list uh, uh, influences cited uh, in the creation of, of patents. And this one had three blog posts from Google, the official Google blog on uh, the uh, high quality uh, site algorithm and and there are there are uh, uh, like seven or eight posts at the official Google Webmaster Central blog that have the words high quality in them these were three of those these were three of the earliest ones uh, if you read through it read through the history of, of Panda uh, the uh, Wired interview with Matt Cutts and Amin Segal, uh, uh, you'll see at some point that there was a recognition for a need to somebody to come along and be a hero. And in, in this case, it was Panda. He was the one who came up with the questions they used to determine uh, 
what quality websites had. And if you read through this patent, it sort of lacks on the types of signals they might look for that determine the quality of pages. It's got like two paragraphs where, where it says, uh, uh, these are the types of patterns we might look for, and then it goes on uh, uh, for about 10, 15 sentences and identifies some things that might be signals of low quality. Uh, there's one section uh, that talks about uh, uh, pages on sites that aren't very responsive. Instead of actually returning the page when you click on a link, you get a server error, or you get a broken page, or whatever. And and that's one of these patterns they say is an indication of low quality. Right. In the the Google Raiders Guide Bill, they actually talked about that as well. But even when elements of a site interfere with the main quality, because they they break it down into main quality, uh, secondary, con sorry, main content, secondary content, things like that. They also talk about, yeah, what, what happens when elements of a page are getting in the way and interfering with the quality of a, your ability to use the page, essentially. So, so one of the odd things about the patent that I came across was in the beginning they talk about uh, graphical representation warning to uh, uh, somebody. And you, you don't know if it's searchers, but it could possibly be quality raters. It doesn't say they are, but but that seems like the most likely thing. Uh, when I looked at the patent, the, the day I looked at it, Google said, we're going to start showing warnings to searchers that the devices they use and the technology on a site don't match. So if you're like looking at a website and trying to view what's going on on an iPhone, and iPhones and Flash don't play together, uh, so if the website shows what it shows in Flash, uh, then in the search results, Google might show a warning saying your, your iPhone won't display important parts of this page because it's in Flash. So I, I'm, I'm, the, the patent goes on in the beginning and tells us this patent was, is written with the intent of identifying uh, uh, domain placeholder pages, content farm pages, and link farm pages. So there's actually a link quality element to this too, at least in the original conception of this patent. So so the patent looks like it was written maybe for quality raters to give them a warning that, that these pages uh, uh, were somehow filled with spam of some type. And ask because it would be silly for you to do a search and and see a set of search results that had warnings in them about the pages that you're about to view, telling you, uh, halt, don't go no further. This is a link farm website. Uh, if you want to keep on going, click on the button. Otherwise, we can send you to an alternative page. Uh, so so the way the patent's written, uh, the invention they came up with maybe isn't geared towards uh, searchers, but rather uh, uh, these quality raters. That's pretty interesting uh, uh, distinction. Um, uh, before I ask the, my follow-up question, Mark, you flashed a comment. Do you want to uh, you think we should introduce that now? Uh, we can save. No, but yeah, okay. Um, so why would they do that, you think? Why would they have a patent targeted at uh, quality raters? When you patent something, you can't patent a broad general idea. You've got to actually patent some type of invention. Uh, patents don't always define every aspect of them and how they work. Uh, uh, if, you're, if you're somebody who has knowledge of, of the technology, you, you may have some idea what's going on, but, but they're not roadmaps. Well, I think they, they also do, you know, you and I are used to that phrase, those skilled in the art. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's kind of their way of broadly covering stuff, too. Almost the end of any patent, those skilled in the art knows that it can be used for this, that, this, that, you know. And uh -huh. thus and that's patent trolls were born. So. <laughs> one, of the, one of the things I got when I was reading that was 
it, it struck me that they didn't have faith in the technology at that time to algorithmically pull out quality. So it, it struck me that it was a patent to feed a list to the quality control people. These are the sites you should be looking at and making a priority. That, that's sort of how it came across to me. I, I got tweeted at some some concerns about the patent and how I was reading it, it from Michael Martinez. One of the things he tweeted was, this doesn't make sense that people could use their phone to determine the quality of a website. And I'm thinking, you know, well, the computing actually goes on in the cloud. Yeah. The phone is just an interface. Uh, it doesn't matter. It could be a wristwatch. Uh, yeah, and as we talked about before this show, there is a separate set of Google quality raters for mobile than there is for the core search. So. Right, right. But the device that all quality raters might be using could be a phone. Uh, because in some places, phones are a whole lot more prevalent than uh, desktop computers. Let, let's throw in this question here from uh, Christian Sepulveda uh, before we get off the subject of patents. Just to clear up something, he said, uh, your, your post on Moz is based on a first approach to quality content by Google, uh, let's say Panda 1.0, but now it's now it's Panda 4.0. So maybe a big change from that. It's you know, Panda went through a number of iterations. There was update 1.1, 1.2, 1.25, 1.3, 1.4. There were like 30 of them uh, before. Uh, Panda 4 came out. Well, and there's, and there's a difference between a refresh and a rewrite. You know what I mean? Right. The, the right. most recent one was, was an adapt, a, a full on mm -hmm. adaptation of the code, whereas the other iterations were actually just refreshes, the old Google day, Dance Days kind of thing. Right. The, the filing of this version of the patent uh, uh, coincides well with the initial release of the first version of Panda because it's within a year of it. Uh, the the fact that that uh, we only had the few sentences and then few description of patterns that that Google might look for to determine quality on a website, uh, it's nothing like Amit Singhal's 23 questions or or the Wired interview statement uh, uh, that that uh, Panda came along with a bunch of questions that were really helpful. Uh, so, so yeah, it it does look like uh, now Neat Panda sort of uh, uh, was the cavalry in for the rescue. Uh, so so let's uh, actually talk about those uh, two other things a little bit though. Uh, uh, I'll make uh, twenty three questions and uh, also the uh, um, the interview, the wired interview. And just a quick uh, program note before we get to that for our live viewers, we're being told the the comments are not updating on the live event page. Uh, either on desktop or mobile, something's broken there. But keep commenting, keep asking questions. We are seeing them on Comment Tracker in the live show. So keep well, well, your comments, especially your questions. Well, you are. I'm not seeing Comment Tracker comments. Well, um, I'm, I'm getting them, but uh, we'll, we'll monitor them for you. You just, you just do the, the big thinking, Bill. Okay. <laughs> to, to, to fill in really quickly and, and finish, uh, uh, it was Christian, to finish answering his question. Uh, so I did... Uh, write a blog post about a patent that came out that had Panda as one of the authors uh, a month and a half ago or so, two months ago. And it provided a completely different way of, of uh, understanding the quality of pages. And uh, it's probably a much better match for Panda 4 than this patent. Uh, it may be Panda 3 for all I know, though. Yeah. But 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 the timing's a lot closer to Panda 4. It's appropriate for that. Uh, so so we don't know if it's one of them, if it's the other one. Uh, but we were going to talk about was what was your uh, uh, next questions, Eric? Uh, well, the 23 uh, questions from Amit Signal as well as the Wired interview with Amit and Matt. Okay, so the 23 questions was another of the Google Webmaster Central blog posts that used high quality in the titles. <laughs> uh, I, shall, I shall go get it and drop it into the event page, guys. No, that'd be great. And it was very much written mm -hmm. in response to, well, you you have hammered all our sites with Panda. What do we do? What, what do you think a quality site is? So that's why mm -hmm. I think people associate it. That was the one where it was pretty much 
question for question stuff that matched uh, one of the early author the writing guides, didn't it? Right. right. So we, we took so credit card to this site and things like that. Yeah. So what type of algorithmic things can we look at? What types of questions that we can ask that we can interpret uh, uh, through a computer? Uh, not necessarily looking at like Google Analytics type uh, questions like, like what percentage of the uh, forms are being filled on pages on the website, but rather uh, the things like do they have uh, HTTPS for uh, transferring data securely? Uh, do they have a, a link to a, a privacy policy? Do they have a link to a, 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 a terms and conditions? Now, maybe that's a sign of quality, maybe that isn't, but, but uh, the patent said we're going to uh, take these patterns that we use and give them different values. So we may have one pattern that, that is only worth like 10 points, and we may have another uh, pattern that's worth 1,000 points. Uh, it, it doesn't say 10 points or 1,000 points, but it does say different uh, content quality scores for different patterns. Yeah, so, I'm going to flash this question from Ammon here. When you say page quality, do you mean just the page itself? And it does not include incoming links and off-page things. I would, I would disagree, probably with Bill, but I'm going to say yes. It's only the page. But so, so, <laughs> so the patent says a couple of the patterns that they might look at can include things like uh, well-known advertising links on a page. So, so if there's if there's somebody who Google's like identified as somebody who uh, posts advertisements everywhere and 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 this uh, uh, content quality scorer identifies links to that page right and again you look at the the, the um, Google Raiders guide they, they break pages up into main content MC which is your stuff in the middle a secondary content which they define could be anything from uh, navigation to let's give uh, Amazon as an example. People who like this book also like this book. That's yeah. secondary navigation. Even in an e-commerce situation, they would they're they're saying that um, like attributes, meaning this dress and this size or whatever, the ability to quickly find uh, versions of something is secondary content. From there, they also break out ads, which is what I was bringing up. Mm -hmm. Just like Bill's talking about, they break ads into a very separate segment of analyzing a page for the quality raters. And where that placement is of it, how it does it take detract from usability or add to usability, etc. So. There's just such a sparsity of actual patents. I mean, actual patterns on the patent itself. That uh, when I was thinking of uh, what I would write for mods, I I thought, why not do a collaborative effort amongst the readers of Moz in the comments and have people. I mean. Uh, as SEOs, we are the subject matter experts on what makes a good quality website. Or a lot of us are. And, and How about some of us are? <laughs> <laughs> a percentage. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking back to the many times I've done like uh, conversion audits on a website and, and things that might cause a site to perform less well than it really should be. Well, and even on the, the quality rate, I think, Bill, they, they, I, I think, again, I started thinking more about queries and the purpose of a page and your own targeting and whatnot, meaning, you know, you could literally, by one of these dampeners, find an effect that wasn't due to anything you did wrong. And one of the examples that brought that to mind was they showed an example of the query, um, was it, I think it was chicken recipes. And one page had a link, lots of links to different uh, chicken recipes. It was they were they used all high quality sites to start with. Um, the second one was a singular chicken recipe, and the third one was a page that had lots of chicken recipes, but they were the same re recipe, meaning different people posted UGC about that same recipe. And at the end of the day, they were advising them that this one with multiples for this type of generalized query, because they also break down what query classifications are. 
But for that generalized query of just chicken recipes, these two would get a lower quality page quality rating because of these reasons. So again, your, your site may be a great site and, and everything else, but if it's not serving the user intent, it gets a low page quality mm -hmm. score, but that doesn't mean you're not, it doesn't mean you have a bad site. It's just not matching that yeah, query. So I'm going to bring in this question from Mark here uh, that Mark is highlighting from David Graham. Uh, uh, because it fits into this discussion and something we talked about in the green room before we went live. So you may have multiple quality profiles, something for retail e-commerce versus banking versus informational blogging. And I think, uh, David, you were commenting uh, on that there was something about that in the, uh, the, the, the Raiders Guide. Uh, yeah. Um, again, they, they call those the, the more important pages that they require a different set of eyes, as far as we could say it or what they call your money your life pages. Something that wants your money or let's say medical advice or something of that nature. They advise that they, they be far more stringent in, in how they rate those pages or websites because they talked about uh, contact information about us pages and things like that. Um, I mean, we could also think of it in the terms of you've got, a, you've got an e-commerce site, but you've also got a content program in place, which means a blog or articles or something else in your site. So how you're targeting those and what the page quality for those unique elements of the same site would probably be different by the way they're directing their raters, which I think, you know, at some point works its way in into the algorithms as far as page quality. But, yeah, to his question, yeah, it, it depends on the purpose of the site, uh, purpose of the page, purpose, uh, the intent of the query, and the classification of the query. You know, I was joking with some friends earlier that keyword, keyword research is dead. You know, all I do now is all I do now is query targeting and page mapping, and and I think that's actually makes sense because when we think in keywords, we're very limited and flat. When you start thinking in terms of query targeting, other questions come into your mind because if you've got quasi informational queries that, let's say, like chicken recipes again, or something specific, or one that crosses over, like Jaguar, it could be an animal, it could be a car, it could be an operating system, it could be a bunch of stuff. More generalized queries are going to produce more diverse results and thus be harder to target and things of that nature. But yeah, there, there is definite differences between informational pages and, you know, pages that, and even within informational pages. Is that a, a, an informational page that could affect someone's life, like medical information? So, David, David, I, David, I, want to get, uh, sorry, I want to get clarification before we move on. Just something that David said earlier. David, you were giving that example of pages that had multiple user-generated user content or replace the queer versus a, a page that had just like one chicken recipe. And, and which were you saying would probably be considered the lower quality? Well, again, it's query dependent. In, in this instance, the query is chicken recipes. So what, what they were, right, so what they were saying is the page on a reputable site, once again, you've got utility score and a utility score is usability. So all, all um, of the things being... And you, you've got site score, which is trustability and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, in that instance, again, query dependent, in that instance, what they were saying, these two pages would be low page quality scores because one is about a single recipe, the other is about the same recipe over and over, mm -hmm. right? So how to do chicken cordon bleu ten times doesn't suit that query. But if that query was chicken recipes, comma, chicken cordon bleu, that page would have a higher quality, quality score. So the quality score of the page is also relative to the query and the user intent. So when you're doing your query targeting as opposed to keyword research, you need to understand these things as well. What is the intent and how is Google going to understand that based upon the page you're targeting? Mm -hmm. So, so it, it brings out one of the things that, by the way, comes from the, uh, uh, back to our, our friend uh, Ahmed Singles, uh, 23 questions. There were a couple of things in there that um, we're, we're actually uh, on the borderline of uh, of gems and everybody like poo pooed this is like oh it, this isn't helpful, but actually it's like all things from Google. If you read through the between the lines, you can get some really interesting data out of it. One of the things he says is, does this article provide a complete or comprehensive description of the topic? And um, the the reason why I bring that up is, uh, and it also relates to the keyword discussion you guys had where you're laughing about you know keyword. Um, analysis or you know uh, uh, you know uh, keyword research and all that but there's a cousin to this which is you can look and see whether or not your page is addressing the the query the target query in a broad and complete way and thorough way right and that makes it a better answer and I think that kind of fits into your 
chicken recipes example. Well, yeah, but it also fits into how you're spending your resources, your time, and so on, which is what SEO is about. If yeah. you're targeting quasi queries that you realize the again, it forces you to get out of keywords and go back to the SERP itself, SERP out kind of approach. And and if you're looking at that and you realize with your knowledge that Google's giving a mixture of quasi results because it's not sure if the intent's transactional or navigate, well, obviously not navigation, but if that is a transactional or an informational query, they're going to mix those results in, which means there's less room real estate on that first page of Google, which means higher resources and costs that actually get you there. So again, for small business, you want to take that art of war approach and, and go on the longer tail, more specific things when you're doing your keyword research. Mm -hmm. So I'm, 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 I'm going to get this one in this time, okay? So pardon me. <laughs> David, I was up early this morning. I was typing away, typing emails. Were you looking over my shoulder? Wait. <laughs> Off the bend. Uh, it's just I, I've just been uh, stalking you for too many years, but I guess we're starting to take it like. I, I figured that camera sitting there. You can see it. It's on the wall behind you, Bill. Um, so, uh, Emin, you flashed up a question there a second ago. Yeah. Uh, let me just find it again. There we are. Scott Scowcroft asked. Uh, I'm listening to a bunch of SEO guys talking about content, and what I'm not hearing is content as spectacular information told well. No, just to it's all about me. secondary indicators. It's kind of the image in the mirror. Is that right? Well, I, I, I actually don't think that's what we're saying personally. I mean, I think we're, we, yeah, we're taking a technical approach to it because we're technical guys. But that's the topic. Yeah, but if you if you talk about, I mean, seriously, if you think about um, a complete and comprehensive answer to a con uh, 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 a question, that really is talking about, I think, a spectacular uh, information, if you will. But that, that, that's also the bit where we're getting sketchy, isn't it? Because we're not saying how Google knows that it's complete and factual, and, and you know how we haven't touched on that as a metric yet. We're saying, yeah, if it's on this dodgy domain, it's it's like that, and if it's got a you know a thing showing you it's a, a hosted page just parked there, that's that's bad. And if it links to these networks or it's got loads of affiliate links. How are we looking at the quality? How are we looking at the actual article itself? Well, I, I, posted, on the, I posted on the event page earlier today uh, Google's little list for the manual, because the big brother of Panda that few people seem to know about it, is the actual manual penalty for thin content. And, and, and in there, they talk about uh, you know affiliate stuff and, and all that kind of thing. I mean, you know what I mean? And that's the big, that's the real. Forget Panda. You get hit by that when you got serious problems. Mm -hmm. So somebody searches for pizza. They don't want Picasso. They don't want Hemingway. They don't want exceptional content. They want to be able to get some pizza for lunch. They want a way to order it. They want a button to press. Uh, they want to uh, maybe be able to order ahead of time. But the responsiveness of that site, its ability to inform and uh, interact is what's important, not how brilliant it is as a piece of content. Right, but that makes it a spectacular answer to that question, right? Just I, we're, I know that's semantics at this point, so I agree with you. It's not this uh, uh, long-form article because that's inappropriate, but it's the best possible answer to that question. And that kind of loops us back around to the discussion we were having about it's query-specific, right? Yeah. So when right. They, it's about query intent. What is the intent of the user's query? Yeah, absolutely. But this, this, let, let's bring this this full meta. How would Google say? How would Google look at what's quality in terms of answering the question? If somebody searches for, what's the panda pattern all about? They would uh, highlight this shell. Uh -huh, they would. <laughs> well, you'd be number two. Bill's already number one. Ranking number one. Let's get this. Because <laughs> it's got the word patent in there. Yeah, there's an excellent yeah. chance that Bill would rank very, very highly for that, if not top. Well, let's go back to the other end of the scale and look at what Google's doing itself with the with the quick answer boxes uh, in the knowledge graph. Uh, there's an indication again, query intent being taken to the max. When an intent, when Google thinks an uh, query can be answered in a very brief answer, it's going to grab that answer off of some website and put it right up at the top without uh, without a click through. So, you know, there you go, the full scale. Even Google believes that such brief content can be valuable depending on the query. Well, that's right. But they're, just, gotta, gonna go, they're, they're, they're just gonna take on the Orion approach and no click search it, it'll just show up in the knowledge, the, the cards from now on, so forget uh, it. To, there's there's to, a moment there, guys. I gotta, I gotta jump in on that one. On some of the step-by-step -step instructions, as Barry Schwartz called it, uh, actually, the information is incomplete. You have to click through to get the rest right. of it. 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and I don't even think we've touched on on um, the whole concept of, of, of temporal elements. You know what I mean? Um, totally. You know, so so we always call it QDA, query deserves freshness, or QDF, sorry. But you know, when you start reading the, the Raider Guide, they break it down into breaking news, recurring events, uh, current information such as population of Paris, um, product queries such as iPhone, Toyota, Camry. These kind of things deserve freshness. So again, you you could have. You know, you, you could type in something about tornadoes, but depending on, on the temporality of is, is that someone looking for breaking news and they live in Indiana or something? And and so or or let's say you type in about the Stanley Cup. Is is information from two thousand and ten as important to the user as two thousand and fourteen? Is that current information that they're looking for? And and so again they talk about user intent. What potentiality in a temporal nature? Are people looking for just because you've got the best damn page in the world about something? If it's in a in a query space where Google considers to be temporally sensitive, you still may not rank because you're not targeting it in that sense. You're just targeting a term, but you're not realizing that that query space is requiring some sort of temporality or freshness. So, so let me give you an example, of that, which is uh, Red Sox versus Yankees. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a document inception date issue with a, a look at how mature or how fresh the uh, rest of the search results are as an indication of whether or not Google should return a fresh or a mature result. Right. And if you do the search Red Sox versus Yankees uh, during the season, uh, mm -hmm. you will see the next time they're playing and you'll see the, uh, the schedule for that. If you do it during the game, you'll see the current score, and if you do it during the off season, you get returned uh, a page about the history between the Red Sox versus the Yankees. I, I have screenshots for all of these, so I know. No, no, I, I would totally believe that. Again, that's the kind of things I've been seeing, what I've been looking at as well this week. And that's and then, exactly how they're defining. Relevant relevance can be temporal. You know? That that matches the uh, many user behaviors uh, that the uh, one box patent. Uh, I wrote about in 2007 on search engine land uh, tells us Google would look for. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, the temporal things you described, the uh, user behavior. If they, uh, Google gets so many millions of queries and questions a day, it often gets the same one for uh, the same types of things, Yankees versus Red Sox. Uh, during the game, you may not be the first person to perform that search. I'm willing to bet that you aren't, uh, but but if if people do the search and people keep on clicking on the one box or or the recap or the box score that's listed in that one box, Google's going to keep on showing it. Yeah. Okay. The, New ranking the examples factor, I give, right? the, um, the examples I give for why that's so important, the the the, the, the freshness thing, is to understand the day before 9/11. If somebody typed in Twin Towers, they probably wanted directions or some pictures. Mm -hmm. On the day it happened, they wanted news um, and the, and the backstory. The day before Hurricane Katrina, if somebody typed in Katrina and the waves, they were interested in the pop group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. So, but, uh, Google has to adapt to these changes in meaning very fast. Yeah. Yeah, you introduced a whole new topic area, Bill. There's this notion of uh, click-through rate or uh, uh, being a factor. So people, a lot of people are clicking on it. Therefore, it'll stay mm -hmm. up there. Well, there's a burstiness flag that says we need to show something different. So let's put our feelers out. Let's see if people click. And if people click, that reinforces the notion that it should be displayed. And there's yet another concept, the concept of testing it. Mm -hmm. Let's see Let's see how people respond to it. If they like it, we'll keep it. Yeah. yeah. So going back a bit to the, the, the quality thing, let's take that, that, that chicken recipes, OK? Yeah. There's, this time, there's three articles. One is a famous chef who's written dozens of books, and they've, they've written a piece. It's not the longest. The, the longest is the second piece. It's a beautifully researched thing on lots of recipes by somebody who's never cooked a dish in their life. Looks good. Uh, and the third is on a big food network. This, this 
you know, it runs some TV shows. It's got lots of books. Well, yeah, literally two of the examples they showed were from the Food Network dot com. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'll buy that. So, yeah. which of those are the are the quality signals in that? How and how is Google determined? Again, again, one page from the site was one page wasn't because one page was a specific recipe which didn't fit the user intent. And one page had a list of multiple art articles on different recipes. Yeah, but say they did recipe rather than recipes. Okay, so the patent... I believe it actually was recipe. I'd have to look, but... The patent doesn't provide any indications of, of how much they might penalize the site. It, it, it uh, was... More just well, again, no, Bill, Bill, I'm, I used to call it a panda a dampener, and I'm starting to think that it's actually a, a, it's promoting pages as opposed to dampening. Right. I'm starting so, to get that sense. You know, it's it's a search quality determination. It's not a, a web spam determination. It's a, and a usability because again, remember they they also break it down into primary co uh, main content, secondary comment, and ads. And, and as I was showing you that graph beforehand, and I've got a few other large scale sites that have panda problems right now, those ad placements are, are heavy as well. And I know people from back in the day that certain prominent sites that got hit and they actually moved those ads, and these are millions of queries a month sites. Um, you know, when they moved those ads, they rebounded over the next few iterations, refreshes of Panda. So mm -hmm. usability seems to be the, the call of the day, I think, almost. You know what I mean? If it's placement of ads, if it's quality of the content itself, if it's the secondary content navigation, you know, these seem to be, you know, all usability factors. So I think there's a large amount of usability that, that's going into the thinking there. Google, so, did a, Google did a study a few years back where they released uh, a report uh, of information they collected on websites, like how many HTML errors they were coming across, and then they were breaking down those different types of errors. And I don't know if that still exists, uh, but I was wondering when Googlebot does crawl a site, follow links, look at redirects. Yeah, stuff if like it that. helps, I mean, one, 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 one thing I'm consulting on for Panda right now has 77 million 404s. <laughs> <laughs> I kid you not. It was a new record, dude. I was like 77 million. But it's a Q&A site, and so they they get rid of old pages that are inactive and stuff. So I don't think their strategy was the greatest, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I've done an initial review audit on that site. Uh... Oh, it was somebody we both know in the industry, so it's entirely possible. Yeah. <laughs> Back up a little bit. I want to go back to actually Ammon's question. I'm going to translate it a little bit because I think, uh, and, and Ammon, you can tell me if I got this right. The first example you gave uh, was somebody who's a really known authoritative author, right? Yeah. So uh, we can ask yeah, Mark right. Pat Hagen's favorite favorite question of, about you know author rank and and the power of that. And then the second example you gave was from somebody with no particular expertise. But it was extremely well written and researched, and the most comprehensive. Of okay, the when, when they they also wait, wait, let me finish. Oh, let me sorry, finish. Sorry, sorry, sorry. And the third one was the authority of the publishing site. So I think you deliberately gave us three different things to think right. about. Mm -hmm. uh, and and wait, so David, that's going to come back to the again the nature of the query. Again, yeah, if that's what you're the it, first time. We're going back to it because we didn't like that answer. We're, we're trying to get. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, chicken those, chicken. Those How do those okay. three different things all balance out? Which is the most okay. important? Okay. Now, page quality doesn't isn't affected by site quality or meaning authority of of the entity. Okay. So, and the scoring for the authority of the entity is kept separate. They have two little boxes as search quality raters. They have two little boxes and they pull these little things to rate it, right? And so that's a separate one. Um, authority of the site, and that's going to be very dependent on your money, your life type stuff. Obviously, a chicken recipe, okay, it could kill you, but I'm <laughs> 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 oh, sorry, this isn't like a your money, or your life type page. And so the 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 page quality rating isn't as dependent on those kind of elements of authority. Let's put it that way. You know what I mean? The authority elements come in more on the your money or your life type pages. So in, in the instance of the recipes, authority is not going to play into it as much as the, the usefulness of the page. It doesn't match the intent. So, you know, chicken recipe, even as a singular, 
the page they're would are seemingly advising to have a high the highest uh, page quality score for that would be based on that. They do also mention you know the authority of the site, so I, I think big brands are going to have a leg up, and I think you still if you're a small business got to take the outside route with the long tail, but you know. Well, the, 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 the three I gave, and the reason for this specifically is you know one of them is the brand because it's it's the the cooking network. So is yeah. brand still an important thing? Yes, the yes. They they do it. say it's a trusted website. They do say that they, as the example. The second is that the author really knows this topic. There's going to be lots of, of links to that author, um, but if there is anything in the algorithm at the moment about authorship, that's where it. I would be. say it would tie to it for sure. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, I don't think they have given them the tools as the quality raters to do that. Um, it's so probably I, the one I, that's going to they, they, they give them some rough guidelines for checking reputation, is what they call it, mm -hmm. which is probably what we'd call authority. But they their reputation is more to see if you know someone's a scammer or you know whatever. Um, so yeah, they they do mention that. So I you know you want to call it brand authority or whatever that does tie in, and it would make logical sense given how you know, they deal with entities on the, on the other levels that that would tie into it for sure. Yeah, yeah I would say it plays in. Um, what was it that Eric said though that had me going there? Oh, crap. The uh, uh, second thing was I was talking about comprehensiveness of the content, even though the person wasn't an expert. Oh, right. So it was a very interesting thing there because when they talk about um, assigning authority and expertise, they use actually forums as an example. And they actually tell the raters within there that somebody talking on a forum, regardless if there's some known entity or anything else, should still be considered an expert on the topic. Literally, they say that. Because, as long as the forum's not full of spam and the other qualifications and things of that nature. But they do mention that, yeah, and they say you should read it as someone visiting the site, not someone participating in the conversation, meaning keep your emotional biases outside of it. So, But yeah, they, they do actually talk about people other than just blog posters and things like that. Um, those sharing experiences and they use the medical example again on like a forum or something could still be considered somebody that's an expert because they're discussing that topic. Cool. So and can they, you know, without uh, drawing this away too much, the, the problem that I think is still existent and why this isn't a stronger indication at this point is uh, actually identifying that person uniquely and carrying that identity over into other things they might be doing online. Uh, you know, as well as what, uh, you know. Yeah, what and that didn't work out so well, so now we can all have uh, our, our forum names back on Google+. Plus. We don't have to use our real names. <laughs> well, didn't long, work out. As long as the uh, log strings of characters in the URL stay the same. Uh, <laughs> totally. So, um, okay. Uh, so we've covered a lot of ground here. Uh, um, one thing I, I want to bring out is, uh, I mean, we've been talking about content quality. I think we got a lot into other kinds of ranking signals. Just want to point out that those, of course, could still be things that would impact the assessment of content quality, uh, remembering the query-specific and temporal aspects of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, of what we're talking about as being part of this picture. So it's really important to differentiate those things. Um, and, and that sort of leads to so Google... Uh, especially when you talk about the the, uh, the quality raters guidelines, um, it's this is for people in manual review. Does not necessarily mean that their algorithm is detecting all this stuff and acting on it. Okay. No, no. I, I'd imagine they've got algorithms that they have in their own frame of mind and the frame of how they do things. The, the quality raters are merely testing those theories to see how they work out in the real world and, and, and what they can gain from that to go back to the algorithms with. I don't think by any means these, these type of documents are telling us anything about the algorithm structure. You know? I think Eric was asking more about the reviewers who might be looking at a site manually to uh, see whether it's deserving of a, of a penalty. Was that what you were talking about, Eric? Well, no, I mean, it, it's reviewers for penalties, but it's just, you know, everything in general, it's, uh, there's a difference between what Google might tell someone to do in a manual review of a page, whether it's for uh, rating the value of an algorithm's output uh, or for assessing a penalty, um, you know, they, they can write much more stringent guidelines. It doesn't mean their algorithms can enforce that. 
Yeah. So if we make an observation uh, uh, that uh, um, you know in in one of these documents, be it a patent or the the the, the guidelines document, that Google thinks that such and such is a signal of quality, doesn't mean their algorithm can actually rate it the same way a human can. There's mm -hmm. a very important no. distinction there. But also, uh, I think one of the things we haven't actually stated, but it's important to note, is that. You know, Google are still doing this within a set framework. What they want to do is provide good results for searches. So we're not talking about judging the quality in terms of giving it a literary review prize. We're not talking about you know news <laughs> articles winning right. Pulitzers or you know a Nebula Award winner for for fiction for a great blog post. That's not what Google's trying to do. They're just trying to make sure that this is reliably going to give their searchers, their customers good information so that people will come back to Google again because they, they're getting good answers from their questions. Well, right, so. here, here's, uh, here's your list of what they, you know, at least to the reviewers, what makes up a low quality page. Uh, is the quality of the main content low? Is there an unsatisfying amount of main content for the purpose of the page? Is the author of the page or website does not have enough expertise on the topic? Um, the eat, you know. Anyways, uh, the website has a negative reputation. The secondary content is distracting or unhelpful. In addition, the following characteristics by itself may be a reason for a low rating, that there is unsatisfying amount of website information, and that's your contact and about us pages. The uh, page is lacking in helpful secondary content. The page design is lacking, for example, the page layout or specific elements of it distract from the main content, making it difficult to use. Or the website is lacking maintenance and updates, the one that's... Uh, Bill mentioned earlier. <laughs> so, so three three winters ago, the New York Times published an article, or a reporter at the Times published an article, saying how much Google had gone downhill, how their search results had suffered, and and uh, every query they tried, the per they looked at three or four pages, and they couldn't find one that made them happy in any way, and uh, when the day after Panda was released, or Search Engine Land did an article about it, the New York Times published another article said, okay, we're here to give you an update on, on the quality of Google's search results. Now, now, the New York Times wasn't the only critic. There were a lot of them. It, it, was, it was enough in the media that, that Google had to play theater. They, they actually had to do something that, that was visible, that had an impact. And how many, how many what, 11.9% of all queries were impacted by Panda? The big update. Yeah. That's for sure. So well, well, let's ask another question, because I'm going back to uh, uh, Amit's 23 questions, because uh, there is really some juice in there. Does mm -hmm. this article have spelling, stylistic, or factual errors? And how do you check that? You check against Wikipedia? You do what? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Spelling, right? You do spelling errors, right? No, well, spelling, but, sure, but, but factual? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Well, to be I think what they'd be looking for is the things that they can instantly tell from the answers boxes. I.e., you know, the president's age is wrong on this article. The article's wrong. Right. And right. they do have that, and they have that to call up in a millisecond. Yeah, so obviously, there, obviously there's some there's there's a growing list of facts that Google has confidence in because they put them in the, the answer box. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, the Earth is the third planet from the Sun. So if it, that's a testable thing, if a site says the Earth is the fourth planet, that would be a factual inaccuracy. And there and there are places that can be used as knowledge bases to do fact checking. Uh, uh, there was a paper a couple of years ago about Netflix as a source of information from movies because Netflix uh, had an uh, economic incentive to uh, have one movie per page. So a movie that there were new versions of or older versions of would have separate pages. But, but they, had, they had handled this ambiguation really well, better than Amazon even, because of that economic incentive. Uh, I think uh, Cheryl's question here is important because uh, it reflects a misunderstanding that some other people may have about what we're talking about with the manual raters. 
Uh, she's saying, you know, if they have if they're manual raters instead of instead of an algorithm, then things like images or videos might be beneficial. I think she's misunderstanding that the raters actually affect the search results, and and they don't. Can can we explain again what these manual raters actually do? Well, yeah. Again, Google has sets of algorithms designed to accomplish various goals, and and obviously, they, as engineers, they can't come to too many everyday people and say, "Okay, how do you like this algorithm?" You know, they're not going to know what the hell it is. So essentially, it, it's a focus group. They they design a focus group of people that, based upon a certain set of criteria, go in and evaluate search results on, for certain queries, as well as the pages that are linked to from those results. So they're, they're trying to help them judge if those processes are working as intended. They're not really changing the results themselves. But they don't push any buttons that reject your site or... No. Right. Not when they're checking the algorithm, but there are another kind of manual writers, the, the people who check your sites, the spam quality team, who, yeah, they may be sent by these kind of algorithms as well. Panda says this one's an edge case. You know, this one, this one is 80% sure it, it's low quality. It's got so many signals saying it's low quality, we're pretty sure it is. So that's out the results. This one, it looks like it's good quality, but we're only 60% sure. It, so it pen, might not be. So this is one maybe we want somebody to look at. Mm -hmm. The patent mentions that there are a couple of like user behavior type things that Google might be able to follow and to flag for review. Uh, uh, so, so yeah, while this may be quality raters looking at these initially, uh, they may sometimes be uh, returned back to them at points in time when site starts behaving badly or oddly. Uh, you know, again, that, that could be a pattern that, that could be set up in advance that's that like a cron job where rather than a specific time it might be triggered by something else. Uh, a sudden surge, you know, the types of messages that you see at Webmaster Tool that say things like, we've noticed a lot less clicks on your website lately. Uh, and you may want to look into that. Uh, yeah. yeah, I saw one in Webmaster Tools the other day. It was warning about uh, mobile usability as opposed to the regular SERP. It was a very uh, device-dependent warning. I'm going to fire up uh, this question that Mark has highlighted for us uh, uh, from William Rock. So if you've been hit by Panda, can you come back? So, uh, well, since no one else jumped in, uh, yes, you can come back. <laughs> uh, it's what I, it, it, my PayPal address is... Yeah. Um, <laughs> send your che make checks payable to. Um, yeah, by, the way, <laughs> uh, by the way, since I answered the question first, you now know which of us on this panel to uh, actually should, contact. Uh, uh, we were waiting for you to throw it out. I mean, you, you picked it up. We weren't going to interrupt you. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I paused. In, uh, <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, it's totally recoverable. Completely, it's yeah. a lot easier yeah. than something like Pe Penguin, which hardly ever runs anymore. So. <laughs> Yeah, but we, no. may, we, we may not necessarily want to go back to where you were. We may want well, no, to, you, you'll never fully recover, I don't think. We, we may want to improve the amount of money you're making off the website, the amount of people who find you in search and so on. Yeah. So the, the big thing to know is when you have been hit by Panda, uh, it's, not, it's not always the case, but it often indicates a business structural problem. Uh, and if, if you get past that test, it may be a very basic site structural problem, uh, and if you're lucky, it's something smaller. I've seen situations ranging from uh, telling a site to no index 98% of their pages. Well, uh, and, and there, there is inherent pain. There will be, because in some of these instances, it's a usability thing where you've got your ads, and, and again, the one I was showing you guys before the show, the other person that brought me in, a well-known friend of ours in the business, that had warned that he told him about this last December. And when this most recent panda hit, it's 50% down. And on you know when you're doing 8 million Google referrals a month, that's a big bloody number. And and why? Because the ads and where they were were making money, so they were resistant to move them. But now that they've lost 50% of the traffic, they're losing even more money. So sometimes you can have short-term pain. You know, there, there are financial ramifications to what Panda does, and sometimes to do the right thing to get your traffic back, 
is going to cost you, but not as much as it's going to cost you in the long run. Google's not going to turn around next month and say, ah, we were just kidding. Put those ads back up in the contextual space. We don't care. You know, that's not going to happen. And I think that's something important for a lot of business owners to understand. Yes, you might lose money because of something, a change like that, but you, it's inevitable that you have to. Yeah, we, we have one site actually where uh, our most fortunate example, we uh, um, were able to no index uh, one section of the site. Uh, it was actually not the core revenue producing uh, portion of the site. And uh, uh, and and that was it. it was, that was that one section they didn't like, and um, and they took down the whole site uh, traffic because of it. So it was pretty sweet, uh, but that's rare. Um, here's a question from Rebecca Morrow uh, that Mark has highlighted for us: How much do 302 redirects bring down page quality, and what would you? So uh, we can probably steer that question a, a little bit more and. Um, so there's two ways you can interpret it. 302 redirects to a page versus just too many 302 redirects on your site. So guys, yeah, take I, it whatever direction you want with that. I, I would say that doesn't affect the page quality at all, but it will affect your rankings. That's a whole different SEO issue, and it's nothing to do with Panda or the quality of the page once you get there. It's to do with the fact that your, your structure is not very good. Yeah. I think that's a fair assessment. Okay, guys, we're we're into our uh, final four minutes here. Do do we want to uh, open up a new thought thread, uh, or are we going to wind down here? Well, I thought you were going over. Come on. Well, <laughs> you gotta you gotta bring in a new thought thread if we're going to go over. And, you know, I want to. Uh, I'll leave the floor open. You know me; I can talk all day. So I'll, I'll okay, so, so I'll, I'll so I'll bring one up really quickly. All right. So the thing that really struck me about this patent was that it was so unfinished. It had so many missing parts. It it was like so poorly planned that that Panda had to ride in on on his horse at the end and and save Google. Uh, it 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 just you know, are we going to see further things like that from Google? Uh, do we really need? 30 versions of Panda. What we're on Panda 4.0 right now. Uh, yeah, and, and Panda 4.0 is supposed to be the version that was much friendlier to small business people. It, it shares its uh, uh, shoots and leaves. Well, I think it, it might be friendlier to, to small business people because of how many huge sites I'm getting as clients lately. <laughs> They're beating up on the big boys. That's why it's friendly to small sites. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I suppose that's true. But I actually did see some sites get a partial recovery uh, that hadn't yet done enough to uh, deserve it. So it seemed to me like they took the the intensity of the dial and they they didn't to turn it they didn't turn it on or off, but they just lessened the impact somewhat. Uh, I saw that across a number of sites. I, I could even say a tweaking because, you know, I've got one um, Panda instance that's definitely a Panda, um, did all the forensic homework, and his, his pain was only about 10%, whereas, and again, these are the million plus you prefer from Google kind of sites. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I saw another one that took a 50% hit, so I, I think there's multiple layers and. In, in, I think maybe they could have refined certain parts not to hurt as much or something because, yeah, I've seen small hits and I've seen really large ones. So, so it's almost, you know, again, I hate, I think this is more of a promoting results as opposed to dampening. I used to think it was dampening. I'm starting to think the other way lately. But I think I think if you've got, it's, it's more layered in the sense that if you've got multiple things that are upsetting um, Google's Panda algorithm, you're probably taking a bigger hit than if you're only satisfying a few. So... As an example, the one was an answer site. And one of the things we find in, in the Raiders Guide is question and answer sites is given as an example. Are there lots of pages with no answers? Because every time someone goes to this site and they type in a question, it creates a new page and a new page. And that's why they had 77 million four of fours because they're constantly cleaning out dead ones. But there is elements of that. So as opposed to this other site that also had ads above the fold and some nasty spots, took a 10% hit, but the rest of the site is fairly clean as far as quality and, and duplication and, and things of that nature. So it's entirely possible that they've layered it some more. I'm not really sure. It's Again, it was May, 9, May 19th or whatever, so I'm 
I'm still crawling around in this thing. Yeah, totally. All right, guys. I think we're kind of uh, each to our uh, end of our header steam, so I'm going to invite you all to uh, give us a, uh, a sort of some closing comments. Uh, uh, and, uh, Emin, you want to start us off? Okay, sure. I think one of the things that's important with these kind of algorithms when you're looking at content is they are always to supplement and to emulate what a human writer can see. And that's one of the reasons why we see so much tie-in with the human writers that, that Google has. And one of the examples I shared in the, in the green room before was that I worked with a, a large review site some years ago. And one of the, the big challenges there was, you know, with thousands of reviews submitted a day, what do we show to, to users? What's going up on the front page when the latest reviews are going in on all of these products and thousands of reviews are coming in? And we, we've got a relatively small team of editors. So we had to look at all kinds of measures of, of dealing with this. And I'm sure that Google has to as well. I'm sure there are layers to Panda. Uh, I would be reasonably sure that you will be seeing slightly different levels of trust when you're logged in to when you're logged out, because that's, again, something we did with the review site. People who were part of the community who bought in and registered with the site were probably going to be a little bit more tolerant of some kinds of errors than people who've got no commitment and this was their first experience. So with Google, I would expect very similar things, that somebody who's logged in and a regular user of Google might be allowed to see and therefore have click data reactions to things that somebody who's not logged in won't be seeing. There will be slightly less tolerance for questionable results in a logged out user's experience. Mm -hmm. Some of these things will be looking um, to replace what an editor can do, i.e. do some, yeah, we know this is bad, so out it goes, and some of it will be, we're not quite sure of this, we're edging on the side of caution, so we're demoting it in search until an editor says it's okay, but it's, you know, high on their list to, to check this one, or we think this is okay, but we're not absolutely sure, so we're going to ask a writer to look at it. It's not demoted for now, but we are going to ask a writer to look at it. Yeah, no, I like that. The, the notion that there's a real granularity there and they can take different actions based on that. It's not all just immediate algorithmic uh, demotion, but there is a, a follow-on action that can occur. Yeah. So, uh, Bill, I'm taking you guys in film strip order here. <laughs> okay. So one of the thoughts that uh, struck me as I was reading the patent, as I was writing about it for Moz, uh, as I was answering comments on Moz, was... Uh, the uh, idea that different types of sites do have measurable ways to determine whether or not uh, what what the quality content uh, score might be for each of those pages. Uh, when you're talking about a, a site with a lot of consumer reviews, uh, one I often think of is Amazon, and Amazon's reviews have. Uh, reviews of the reviews. People can vote them up, vote them down, comment on them, and so on. And uh, I've worked with very large million page sites that are filled with user generated content uh, that, that uh, didn't have those types of uh, uh, reviews and monitoring of user generated content. And, and I think uh, that was one of the reasons why that site suffered a penalty, and it did suffer a penalty. I think because there wasn't that type of control over over the uh, people reviewing the site and adding additional content. Uh, but but you know, just this exercise has has brought back a lot of stuff that I have done in the past on on uh, uh, conversion optimization, and and you know, thinking about how making tweaks and changes to a site could help improve the quality of that site. I, I, I think that's worth looking at. Uh, excellent. Uh, David? All right, I guess mine is simple. Um, I, I deal in forensics, so I deal in a world of pain all the time. Nobody comes to, I'm like a lawyer or a cop. Nobody comes to see me on the best of, of circumstances. They're always hurting. So. For me, I'm just going to go with be proactive. Don't sit around waiting for some algorithmic adjustment or manual penalty to hit you. You know, 
go now today, as soon as you get off this hangout, go look at your site and start thinking about all these things. And, and, and if you can't subjectively do it, ask a friend to and, and consider these things before something like this affects you. Because, again, I think at the end of the day, we keep talking about usability. Everything that Bill and Ammon just said as their summation was about usability. And, and so the, this all makes you money or, or it makes builds your authority at the end of the day anyways. So why not go and address these things? Don't wait for Google to come and get you. Do it now. There you go. All right. And then you won't need me, which is cutting into my bottom line, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. I don't mind. Uh, trust me, you're gonna you're gonna do well anyway. So, uh, Mark. Well, uh, David actually stole my final point, so I'll just jump in and say that uh, it's it's really nice to see that the rest of us have kind of called David up, and he's wearing a nice uh, calm colored golf shirt today. He's not smoking. He's not very very professional. You know, I, I might even consider hiring. Yeah, my wife even made a comment. What the hell's going on? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> she pulled my son over. And went, you look preppy. Look at your dad. I was thinking. Oh. Yeah, that's right. What uh, you who are my you? Father? Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so yeah, he's still sat in the dark with sunglasses on his head. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There you go. <laughs> All right. And, well, so I'm just going to add, uh, you know, one one other comment too, which is uh, actually Scott Scowcroft's question earlier on was an excellent one. Once once you tweak it a little bit, this uh, idea of creating, you know, superior quality content. Uh, uh, tweaking it to the context because for a pizza shop, superior quality content might be that you can order the pizza easily and quickly, pick what you want, get it done, uh, as opposed to some long form article or something like that. So the context is a big deal. It's easy to say. Not everybody out there knows how to create superior content or a superior experience. You're, a few people actually are born with that ability. It's usually something that takes an enormous amount of practice. And no matter how long you've been practicing it, and no matter how long you've been doing it, you need to practice some more because you can still do it better. Mm. Uh, so this is not really a casual thing going on here. It's a very important thing. And it should be a major investment for you, whatever you're doing in your strategy. There is no done to this. I totally agree with what David said about be proactive. But even after you've been proactive, be proactive again. And then <laughs> do it again. And then do it again, because that's the way it has to be in this very dynamic and competitive uh, environment in which we live. Um, and with that, I think we're at the end of the Digital Marketing Excellence Show today. Thanks to a fantastic panel. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. I'm so glad we came together as quickly. Thank you. And uh, uh, have a great day, everybody. Take care.